and thank you for watching this music analysis video on harmony and expectation. Now normally, when someone sits down to study the chordal functions of a tonal piece of music, it's common to start off by looking at the key signature and then check the cadence at the end of the passage to determine a key. Once a key is settled on, the analyst continues with a harmonic analysis of the chords using the key as a guiding framework. By knowing the key, they can isolate specific harmonies and describe their function. Now this approach serves the traditional purpose of analysis, which is to describe how certain events or compositional procedures are constitutive of the music. In other words, it shows how the parts fit into the greater whole of the musical object itself. But the issue with this type of analysis is that it doesn't necessarily capture the time experience of harmonic progressions. Where this method is useful for determining the harmonic structure of the music itself, it offers little to address the real-time experience of a listening person. In order to describe the listening experience, one needs to engage in a more phenomenological approach. Now when you're taking a phenomenological approach, you're focusing on the human perception of things rather than the things themselves. A phenomenological approach to harmonic analysis would show how the harmonies interact with the listener in real time in order to create musical meaning. This means focusing on the present and past harmonies, setting aside what information we gain from a completed hearing of the passage, such as how it cadences at the end. Analyzing based on future events would be problematic for a real-time analysis because, of course, in that moment, those cadences would not have existed yet. Instead, a phenomenological analysis would focus on how present musical harmonies interact with those in the past and how those interactions create expectations for the listener of potential future events. Then it would compare those expectations to what actually happens at the next significant temporal moment. Unlike traditional harmonic analysis, which studies the musical object, the phenomenological analysis focuses on the listening subject. When we talk about how present musical harmonies interact with those in the past, we're talking about placing sonic events in the context of the music up to that point in time. Once that event is placed into a particular context, one can describe how that perception of that event in that context relates to another perception of an earlier event in an earlier context. Through this analytical process, one is attempting to isolate and compare particular perceptions of harmonies rather than the particular harmonies themselves. And those perceptions can include expectations for future harmonies as well. Now, this kind of analysis follows the perception model that David Lewin offered in his 1986 article, Music Theory, Phenomenology, and Modes of Perception. In that article, Lewin offered detailed phenomenological analysis of a small section of Schubert's Morgengruss, in which he accounts for several perceptions in various time points in the music. By engaging with individual perceptions as the object of study, Lewin effectively creates a narrative that tells the story of a listening person as they are experiencing the music. Something to the effect of, First, I heard X, which made me think one thing, but then I heard Y, and it made me think differently about X, and so forth. Now, for many pieces, the narrative for the listening experience can be fairly straightforward. Earlier perceptions generate expectations for a particular outcome that are commonly reinforced in a continuation and then confirmed by a later perception, typically in the form of predictable and unambiguous cadences. However, in some pieces, like Schoenberg's Erwartung, the cadences frequently contradict the expectations formed in earlier perceptions. This creates a more complex story because it triggers the need for a listener to recall the harmonies of the past and retrospectively reinterpret their meanings in light of the unexpected music that is actually sounded, thereby shifting the perception of the phrase as a whole. Now, Erwartung translates to expectation, so I don't believe it's too much of a stretch to suggest that Schoenberg is intentionally playing with listener expectations in the piece. The purpose of this presentation is to illustrate how he does that with a specific focus on harmony and cadences, and how those harmonic effects complement the narrative of the poem. 
I argue that Schoenberg creates specific implications with his choice of harmonies and then consistently subverts them, keeping the listener guessing about the key of the work until the very end. To demonstrate this, we will begin the individual phrases of the music to establish a harmonic context. Then we will pause briefly to discuss the expectations that arise from that evolving context. And then we will complete the phrase and compare our expectations to what actually happens. Through this process, I hope to provide a harmonic analysis that reflects an in-the-moment listener experience. And with that, let's listen to the beginning of the first phrase. After listening to the first few chords, one could reasonably conclude that the piece is creating an impression of an E-flat tonal progression. At the end of the first measure, it's clear that the dissonant C-flat ninth chord that we hear in between the two E-flat chords is a chromatic alteration of what is essentially a pedal tone harmony, like a pedal 6-4. That decorating harmony is repeated twice before passing over to an actual pedal 6-4 A-flat harmony in the third measure. The harmony then passes to C minor and then an F minor 7th chord, giving us a mostly normal sounding root progression of 1, 4, 6, 2. Now this root progression creates a specific expectation for the listener, the expectation of a cadence in E flat. In the music, those diamond shaped note heads are notes that have not physically sounded at this point in the experience, but are implied by the harmonies preceding them. But instead of those notes, we will have our first example at this phrase level, where what follows is not what we are led to expect. The first few words of this song set a pastoral scene, describing a green pond in a red villa over this E-flat major sounding harmonic area. But at the end of the line, the cadence that we would expect to hear on E-flat is replaced by a strange harmony. This harmony has a G in the bass and upper voices that resolve from G and E to F and D. This creates a cadential 6-4 type effect that ends the passage. This strange cadence correlates with the text revealing that the moon is shining and that this song takes place at night. Normally, when I hear the term pastoral in music, my mental image is one of a sunny day. But this unexpected scene reveal and unexpected harmony requires the listener to recall previous harmonies of the passage and retrospectively reinterpret their meanings. Janet Schmolfeld talks about this reinterpretive event in her book In the Process of Becoming. She uses this double-lined arrow symbol to identify it in her analysis of formal themes. I borrow it here to identify reinterpretation, or becoming, of the harmonic progression. Upon reinterpretation, we find that if this last chord is a cadential 6-4 on a dominant, then the E-flat chord must have been a substitute for a C major tonic that this dominant now implies. Now some might argue that this is simply a modulation, that the music was in E-flat and then moved to C. And it's true that one could label one of the earlier harmonies as a pivot chord easily enough. But in my opinion, that kind of description does not truly capture how the listener interacts with these harmonic changes. It describes our perception of key area as though it is a room in which the music stands. If the key changes, it's because the music walked into a different room. This treats the perception of key as a location for the music, like a setting for a film. Instead, I treat the perception of key area as a character of the musical experience. Our perception of that character changes over time as we learn more information about it. Think of a movie where a supposed ally is later revealed to be a villain, and for me, The Dark Knight Rises is a decent example. 
When the love interest Miranda reveals herself to be the daughter of the arch nemesis Ra's al Ghul, I didn't think, hey, that person was a friend and then changed into a villain. I think, wow, that person was actually a villain the whole time. I view this musical phrase as exhibiting a similar kind of perceptual effect. The physical setting described in the text did not change from day into night, but rather it was revealed to us at the end that it always was night. Likewise, the key area did not change from E-flat into C, but rather it was revealed to us at the end that it always was in C. Now, let's listen to the beginning of the second phrase. This phrase begins as a near transposition of the first, this time in C major. Given what we know about the first phrase and the opening of the second, I have two likely options for how the rest of the phrase will unfold. Option 1, the implication of tonic that we were given by the first phrase is the true key of the music, so this consequent phrase will confirm that key, this time with a cadence on C. Or option 2, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. I know that the last time the music diverted at the last second to a half cadence of a key area a minor third lower. So this time, I will anticipate that kind of change to happen again, expecting a half cadence on A. With these two options in mind, let's listen to the rest of the phrase. In this phrase, the unexpected first occurs when the F major harmony progresses to an E-flat in second inversion. That E-flat then descends through two chromatic harmonies and arrives on the same dominant ninth chord over G. As this happens, the text depicts a man by the pond removing his ring. Why he does that is unclear right now, a plot point to be resolved later but I believe it is significant that this action occurs as the first unexpected harmony happens in the phrase. In any case, the phrase, although ending with another unresolved half cadence, continues to reinforce the implication that C is the true key of the song. Now let's continue with the third phrase. In this phrase, the G dominant harmony that ended the previous two is developed with its own dominant and then transposed up by step twice and here we can switch to this voice leading graph to make it a bit more clear. If we're still convinced that C is the established key area, we might conclude that this ascending pattern is reaching toward that C that it had descended from in the previous phrase. However, that possibility dissipates as the pattern stalls once it reaches that B ninth harmony, dying away as the text suggests. As the music continues, we find that that lingering B ninth chord turns out to be an inflection moment in the counterpoint. The piano descends through a series of chromatic harmonies, obscuring any sense of tonality we might have retained up to this point. But then, a clear E flat harmony appears over B flat in the bass, and we have an opportunity to get our bearings.
To me, this E-flat 6-4 chord sounds cadential, and I think it triggers another moment of becoming that reveals a few things for us. And here we can switch to another graph. That E-flat 6-4 chord tells us that the A minor that we heard two chords earlier was a minor subdominant that then passed through a secondary dominant to get to this cadence. It tells us that that B ninth chord that started the passage was actually a German augmented sixth chord that leads into the cadence. But most significantly, it sets up an expectation of a cadence in E flat, which would dismiss the implication of C being the true key of the music. But then, the return of the B ninth chord denies us that E flat resolution in as deceptive a cadence as one can find. That resolution goes right out the window again, just as the text describes. This brings us to our next phrase, which we can start now. As we hear, this phrase begins nearly identical to the first, but now that we have the context of the rest of the song behind us, three likely options come to mind for how the progression will advance. Option one, one could think that the dramatic complications of the song have been resolved, and that the root progression that was originally produced will this time finally conclude with an authentic cadence on E flat. Option two, we're not done yet. This phrase is an antecedent passage, as the first phrase seems to have been. Therefore, it will progress as it did by diverting at the last minute to a half cadence on C. Then, a consequent phrase will conclude the music, possibly on E flat, possibly on C. Or option three. This phrase will progress as the second phrase did by moving chromatically down to the dominant, but this time finally resolving to E flat. So then to recap, our top candidates for what could happen next would be either the original expectation for the first phrase, what did happen for the first phrase, or what did happen on the second phrase but with a resolution this time. So let's see what happens. Essentially, we find that Schoenberg goes with the first option. However, he does obscure things with accented dissonances on C sharp, G, C flat, and E natural before they ultimately resolve to a B flat dominant seventh chord. He also ends the vocal phrase a measure before the piano cadences, further complicating the perception. But eventually, we do get a clear, unambiguous cadence on E flat. So what does this final cadence in E-flat, after all of the ambiguity leading up to it, mean for the work? How does this back and forth between E-flat and C inform the narrative of the poem? I think it speaks to the man who removed his ring earlier in the song, and this woman that beckons him into her villa in the middle of the night. That image suggests to me that the man might be about to commit an act of adultery, and he's outside trying to decide whether or not he wants to go through with it. I think that if the song had revealed itself to actually be in C, it would support the interpretation of a man about to leave his wife for another woman. But I think with the resolution on E-flat, it suggests a more noble interpretation. I see a man whose wife had passed away, and now he's trying to move on. He thinks of her fondly as he stares into the pond outside of the villa, takes off his ring as if to kiss her goodbye, and casts it into the pond. Then he goes inside to meet this new woman, perhaps uncertain of the future,
but finally willing to take the chance. I hope that with this analysis and interpretation, I've shown how by studying harmony in this moment-to-moment -moment phenomenological style, one can reveal an accounting of the experience of key. This style treats key less like a setting through which the music moves, and more like a character of the musical experience that reveals itself to us over time. Especially in pieces like Erwartung, that character can be enigmatic and complex, and by following how that character develops and reveals its true nature, we can uncover hidden meanings that might otherwise have gone unnoticed.